All right, I make it 10.31. So as people are still arriving for the webinar, we're going to get going. I always feel in these moments like we need some lounge music just to sort of keep everybody in the mood whilst, uh, whilst we're starting. But we'll get going now. So I want to say good morning to everybody. Welcome to um, the Pressures of Wellbeing webinar. Um, it's presented by the Cultural Governance Alliance and CLAW Leadership, and it's really good to have you all with us. I'm Jonathan Mays from CLAW Leadership, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm a white man wearing dark glasses with hair and a beard, which used to be far darker than it is now. Um, last month, we held the Governance Now conference in Birmingham, and it was a real pleasure to have conversations about governance, which are face to face again. Um, and I was just thinking about this, and it's really hard to believe that it's already been, or it's already the third anniversary of the first COVID-19 lockdown. Um, running these sorts of webinars that explore issues in governance is one of the really good things that came out of the, that lockdown. Um, and we're really happy to continue that series today. Um, you'll notice as you arrive that we're using Zoom's meeting format instead of webinar settings. Um, and that's because actually in the second half of today's session, we're quite keen for it to be discursive. We want you to be involved as attendees. Um, so you will have time to ask questions of the panel and potentially respond to questions. So when it gets to that, please, I would ask that you um, either put your um, hand up either physically or use the buttons on Zoom or put questions in the chat um, on the Zoom chat. Um, you can either leave your camera on or turn it off. It's up to you. Um, and Freya, our technical person here at Claw Leadership, will be spotlighting speakers and whenever anybody is speaking today. So a few bits of housekeeping. Um, live captions for the session are being provided by Wendy and they're available on stream text. The link for that is in the chat now. Thanks, Freya. Which will be open, that will open in a separate browser so you can follow the captions. Um, we'll be reposting that link throughout today's session. Um, and just also let you know that today's session is being recorded. And we will then upload the recording as a private video on our YouTube channel. And the reason why we're doing that is to give you the chance to rewatch any of the sessions today, but also, and what I really hope you'll do, is to share that video with your colleagues or fellow board members. I think what we really understand is that often people will attend these sessions as an individual trustee or as a chief exec or a senior leader. And actually, we want you to help hopefully share the information you're getting today with your fellow trustees and boards. Um, we will email that link out after the fact. Um, do use the Q&A function or the chat function rather to share your questions. It's helpful if you put the word question in capital letters at the beginning, that helps us to spot them. Um, and if you would like to post your question anonymously, please message me or Freya as the host and we will read, read those questions out anonymously if you'd like. them. That's the housekeeping done. Uh, nice to have you all here. It's my real pleasure now to hand you over to Uella Jackson. Uella is the co-director at Rising Arts Agency, which is a dynamic, radical, youth-led social enterprise that advocates for young creative leaders. In 2020, Uella was appointed a commissioner for the Commission for, the commission for Race Equality for the City of Bristol, and Uella also sits as the chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uella, good morning. Good morning. God, I forgot those things about me. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. So yes, I am Uella Jackson. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a black girl um, with blonde hair and I'm wearing a kind of light brown um, top. Um, so I am a presenter, filmmaker and content creator and one of the co-directors of Rising Arts Agency. So as Jonathan said, we are a radical youth-led social agency, um, enterprise and CIC that supports young people aged 18 to 30 who are underrepresented in the sector to take up space, challenge the status quo, um, achieve their creative ambitions and uh, more importantly, affect radical social change. And we support a lot of cultural and creative organizational development too, through consulting and advocating for transformational governance and new models of leadership. Now we were founded in 2016 by Kamina Walton, who always knew that after five years that she would hand over the leadership to young people. So in 2021, I took over with um, my colleague Jess Bunyan as co-directors. Um, and as we've grown and established ourselves in this weird and wonderful uh, creative sector, it's become apparent that it's actually our ways of working that are fast becoming one of the most interesting things about us. So as well as being genuinely youth-led from our community team and board, 
um, we deeply believe that rest is a vital part of resistance. And in order to build a resilient, innovative creative sector, collective care, rest and reflection need to lie at the heart. So for example, our team have contracted uh, reflection time, so an hour per day per um, per day that they work a week for reading, walking, napping, whatever. Um, in 2020, in response to the murder of George Floyd, um, as more of a, a I guess, as a, as a kind of gut response, we closed the agency for a week to acknowledge the trauma that was going on for the team. And I guess in more um, proactive steps, we closed the agency every August for a reflective month to do more of that reading, walking, connecting, and prior prioritizing well being. So we offer reparative rest fees um, to acknowledge the trauma that comes from doing work that draws on your lived experience. And if that wasn't enough, we have a massive uh, A1 poster in our office that says, work won't love you back, just to give you a vibe of how seriously we take well-being. Um, you know, for us, it's, you know, it goes beyond fluffy slogans and niceties. It's about necessity, you know, whether it's encouraging the joining of unions, mutual aid, forward thinking policies, um, being person centred. And the, that kind of understanding of the importance of well-being is I'm guessing why a lot of you are here today. Um, I wanted to share this, um, this statistic with you. So according to new data by the Workforce Institute at UKG, 70% of people Say, say that their manager has more impact on their mental health than their therapist or doctor. So they have an equal impact to that of their, their partner. Um, and so as a co-director and trustee myself, it shows the real life impacts um, of leadership and governance. And we've got a fantastic panel joining us today who's gonna help us explore what the role of boards and governance and leadership can and should be in ensuring a culture of care that is prioritized, lived and spearheaded by boards. You know, what are some of the tough decisions that need to be made and what are maybe some of the assumptions that need to be challenged in order for us to get to the heart of what this conversation is really about? Um, I hope that you're all um, comfortable. You know, please, uh, I've seen Becky in the chat, please do introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know where you are, what you're doing. I hope you're somewhere comfortable, hopefully horizontal, <laughs> doing something nice for yourself while you're listening listening in. Um, so before I hand over and introduce our, our panels and what and what they're bringing, I wanted to just give a little bit of a um, the running order of, of this webinar. So what we're going to do is we're going to he hear from each of the four panelists um, for about five minutes each, just to hear a little bit more about them, maybe a provocation that they want to share, or the ways that well-being is kind of fitting into their into their governance. Um, so we'll hear from them all for five minutes each. We'll, that will be followed by a 20 minute panel discussion um, chaired by me, you lucky people or not. Uh, and then we'll have a five minute break and hopefully you can kind of get away from the screen and, and go look out of the window. Hopefully it's not as gray where you are as it is for me in Bristol. And then we'll open up questions for half an hour. Um, so please feel free to pop your questions throughout in the chat and we'll get to them in those final 30 minutes. Um, and during that time, you know, we're really keen for that to be a bit of a conversation. So we want to invite you to, um, when, you know, when we invite you to ask your question, please feel free to unmute yourself or um, turn your camera on and ask the, qu the question directly to, uh, to us, to the panel. And um, we can make it feel a little bit more like a conversation. And we ask that if you are doing that, that you can kind of say your name, um, your full name or your screen name, just so that we can find you and spotlight you for the conversation, but that's um, that's optional. So without further ado, sorry for all that talking, let's hand over to our panelists. So I wanna hand over first to uh, Diana Spiegelberg, who's the Deputy Director for Somerset House. Over to you. Thank you so much, Yuella. Um, I am a white woman, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I've got uh, shoulder length dark hair and um, as uh, Jonathan said before, a kind of Brittany mic on, so that's how I'm plugged into my, um, to my laptop this morning. Um, so yes, thank you Yella, Yuella, I'm the Deputy Chair uh, at some Deputy Director, gosh, thinking about governance, uh, at Somerset House which is a centre for cultural innovators 
in a historic space in the centre of London. When thinking about colleague well-being and care, um, I think that Somerset House is potentially interesting for a couple of reasons in particular. The first is that pre-COVID, we were sort of at a tipping point with about 80 core members of staff recognising that we were still acting like a small organisation and needed to start to think differently about how what sort of structures we put in place. Um, and in fact, our staff numbers have grown significantly since coming out of COVID. Um, we're also home to the largest concentration of other arts organisations, artists, studios, creative enterprises, including um, the CLAW leadership um, team. So therefore we see kind of at first hand what challenges other organisations are facing in the kind of arts um, space. Uh, what have we done? Uh, what have the challenges been and what do we see? We did introduce a couple of really positive things pre-COVID. The first was an employee assistance programme, which means that anybody who works at Somerset House, for us or any of our residents, has access to free counselling support, completely confidential. And that's been an amazing tool um, for managers and for staff to know you can, that is signposted and actively promoted. And we've seen huge increase in increases in the take up over the last three plus years. Before COVID, we also um, ha introduced a really active mental health first aid training program, which we were embedding uh, pre-COVID, which I think stood us in pretty good stead over the um, pandemic. But I guess like a lot of organizations, I'm sure on the call today, as it's turned out coming out of COVID, I think has been much, much more challenging than during or going into COVID when it comes to how you look after your um, how you look after your colleagues and I think that's been reflected in where we're investing our time and money when I joined Som Somerset House seven years ago we had a part-time HR officer doing payroll and that that was the role of HR to a large extent uh, since then what we found in the pandemic was our HR manager became our head of HR and was actually completely central to decision making about how we as an organization wanted to try and you know, climb our way out of COVID. And we now have a director of people who is absolutely at the heart of all strategic decision making. And that's, that's a real shift. Um, another thing in terms of emphasis on priority is We've done a lot of work on psychological safety, actively promoting the use of our speak up policy, um, which relates, of course, to our anti-racism work, but I think has a much broader role beyond that. Um, so a uh, couple of other things. Firstly, this is not easy and we do not get it right. Um, Often it is very challenging, particularly in the last year when there's been so much recruitment, all of these great initiatives. But how do you deal with them when you're recruiting for new staff? There are vacancies. So that's been um, a real challenge that and we've got so many external socioeconomic um, factors that we aren't responsible for. But our trustees are really helping. And for the first time, we've just brought on board uh, a new trustee specifically with that people expertise. And three things that we think trustees can do. Um, the first of all is data or what we as an executive can do to support board decision making. Are we giving our trustees the right data? There are, of course, we do an annual employee survey, but that's only anecdotal. I think we could do a lot more in terms of giving our trustees the sort of data to help them make good decisions. Another thing that I think trustees can really do is look at the relationships they have beyond the management team um, to understand what staff are experiencing and a sort of managed program of uh, getting to know a wider um, cross section of staff, because at the end of the day, your staff, they're a key stakeholder for an organization. Um, and the third area that I think is very important for trustees is uh, how they uh, understand organizational culture and behaviors. And I think the more trustees are involved in that kind of behavioral organizational culture piece, the relationships, and do they have the good 
data to make um, decisions. So um, those were, the, I think, the key things that I wanted to share or put into the mix of the conversation now. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was um, making notes and I I didn't realise I, was, I wasn't on mute. So I'm sorry about that. Um, that was really great. I'm really excited to kind of hear about more about that. And also those kind of three takeaways, which is going to be really pivotal for anchoring our conversation later on. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Stephen Lightbrown, who is a poet, yoga teacher, disability rights champion, um, with 20 years experience in senior roles for the NHS and, a tr and trustee roles for other organisations. Over to you, Stephen. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, yeah, my name's Stephen Lightburn. Um, I'm a white male. I've got grain hair, um, unshaven, I've got a green shirt. And what you can't see is I'm also a, a wheelchair user. So I'm sat in my wheelchair as well behind the screen. Um, I'm really pleased to be here actually this morning and having this conversation because I think it's such a crucial and, and critical topic. Um, from my own personal experience, I guess I'm uh, really kind of keyed into this as well. I, I, as was mentioned in the intro, I'd worked for 20 years almost at local, regional and national board level roles at the NHS. And just after the pandemic started, I actually had a real crash at work and completely burnt out and ended up having to take ill health retirement. And for some reason, I guess I was still in that mindset of work, work, work and needing to do things. And so then joined, uh, so rather than actually just sitting at home and going to the cinema or going on holiday or whatever, in that new free time, I joined five boards as a trustee and, uh, and, and became the chair of Canduco and did that for a couple of years. And then last year, um, was in hospital for a couple of weeks with sepsis and actually ended up having about three months recovery from it. I had, and then just took the decision, actually, I'll do what I should have done at the start, which is completely withdraw from all of those roles. Hence why I'm now the sort of uh, poet and yoga teacher, which I've since retrained at and uh, go surfing a lot more. So I think for me, I, I guess that's, that's part of it in terms of that work-life balance. But when I look, back into my time on on board level roles and and in the NHS the thing that I did more often than not is is work with boards and assure colleagues that and and, and recognize that this is intimidating I think it's really hard for a board that is thinking about how they want to support their workforce about where to start because finances are tight the pressures are real Many of the organisations I was involved in over the past couple of years were just worried about whether or not they were going to make next year. And um, so then to think about actually how do we embed a huge programme of, of well-being is really difficult. But I think my answer to that is it's the board doesn't need to take on that sole responsibility. More often than not, staff have the answers. You know, that is where... Um, where a lot of the, the the good ideas lie, and for many of the things that I've I've worked at over the course of my time, you can imagine some of the pressures that that staff feel in the NHS. Um, you know, pre-COVID, that that pressure was was enormous. Post-COVID, it's even more um, exacerbated. And I run many listening exercises, and that is where I would always suggest starting is 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 not assuming that you know or have to know all of the answers as boards. Um, it's about facilitating those conversations. And more often than not, the, the consensus across any organization I've been involved in, any of these conversations that I've had, is that it's staff wanting to feel valued. And for them recognizing that, that for them, those individuals, boards and senior management aren't particularly visible or haven't been particularly visible. And more often than not, I, I heard conversations from staff in A&E that, um, you know, senior management don't know what it's like to, to walk in our shoes. They don't know what it's like to work in an A&E um, seven days a week um, at all hours and the expectations that are on staff. And, and you might feel as though that's not relevant to maybe your organisation, but, but actually those feelings were... Um, prevalent 
in organizations where I've worked with is maybe less than a hundred people. You know, those 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 comments still still exist and uh bad examples that were being set of um emails being sent at midnight and expecting replies out of working hours for people that are really junior staff that feel as though they're having to model the behavior being set by boards who are who are working really tirelessly. And I think the valuing of, of staff and wanting people wanting to feel connected and, and part of what is happening in an organization rather than um thinking right we'll bring in yoga Wednesdays and that and actually what you'll find is that actually doesn't do anything because they'll think I haven't got time to go to to yoga so before you get to the to the initiatives I would say really the most important thing is is talk to your staff and do those basics first and, and, and listen without judgment um and and in talking to chief execs in the past, people said, well, I, I don't know where to start. You simply just ask three questions. What do we start doing? What do we stop doing? And what do we carry on doing? Those three questions will give you most of the answers to what you need to know. And then don't be intimidated by what you hear back. Um, because any answer is is justified and any answer is 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 great because it gives you something to, to look at that barometer jack of where your organization is at. And the reality is you can then be honest and say, we're not, we're not, we're not able to do all of these things. So this is what we're going to do immediately. This is what we're going to do in the medium term. This is what we're going to do long term. And these are the things that we can't do. And these are the reasons why we can't do them. And then once you start to see that change, feed that back to staff and say, these are the ideas that you gave us. And this is where the benefits are starting to happen. And you'll see that that value, that connection back into the organization where organizations are reassessing what, they, what they're about. Organizations are reassessing where the next budget is gonna come from and how, how, how do we kind of navigate our way through this new, new landscape. So many places talk about wanting to get back to normal. Well, that, that normal doesn't exist anymore. So what we're trying to do is find out what the new normal is. Um, and, and where we go from there. And just the final thing I would mention, because I think a lot of this will come up in, in um, the Q&A, hopefully, is again, I kind of come from a, a disability perspective as well. And I think just remember that one in five of the population have a, a, a disability, 80% of which is hidden. So many of your workforce will have health conditions, things that they're working with, things that they're dealing with that are causing distractions and um, things that they're trying to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as doing their, their job. And how we can kind of work to just bring that, that value in again and, and, and helping people be the best that they can be in work and out of work, I think is, is really important. I think a quick, quick question just came in about, um, yeah, those three questions and then I'll finish is, um, what do we carry on doing? What do we stop doing? And what should we start doing? They're the three questions that I've, I've always kind of used in those exercises. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. We're going to head over to Sophie Wallace, who's the executive producer at New Diorama. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Yuella. Uh, my name is Sophie Wallace um, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a white woman. Uh, just about in my 30s with glasses, uh, long brown hair in a ponytail, and I'm sat in front of a sofa bed um, and a cat, two cats, two cats. Um, um, yes, as Yuella said, I am the executive producer and co founder yeah. of the New Diorama Theatre, uh, which opened back in 2010. Um, I'm also a trustee of Rum and Clay Theatre Company uh, since 2018. Um, uh, all of that alongside being a somewhat tired uh, mother to two small humans. Um, it's really great to see so many of you um, attending this morning. When I was first approached to speak on the panel for this, um, it took no convincing at all, uh, as well-being is not only something I both personally and professionally am incredibly passionate about, but is something that I'm just so relieved is finally taking its place at the top of the agenda at this level. So yeah, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk today just from my perspective in, in, in my time at New Diorama. Um, we you know, have constantly seen the needs of um, artists evolve um, with our specific aim 
being both to listen to those needs um, and then respond by finding innovative and uh, radical ways to try and remove or, or somewhat overcome those obstacles. Um, New Dharama has always been a company's theatre, so uh, we're focused on supporting and championing the best theatre companies in the country. Um, and with, um, with that support, an organic programme of, of artist support has evolved over time. Um, I mean, it began with a really basic sort of sort of ladder of support, um, which ranged from things like our two night stand programs, um, which uh, which provided companies with free space to put on two performances of their show, um, whilst uh, then retaining 100 percent of their box office to invest back into um, their company, which which often represented the single biggest investment um, that a company had had at that sort of early stage of their um, career through to things that we run now, uh, which are ongoing, uh, like our artist surgeries, where artists can pre-book, um, come to our cafe um, once a month on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, meet a member of the New Diorama team and uh, talk to us for 20 minutes, ask for advice on anything, um, with, with the hope that it's vaguely relevant uh, and appropriate, but sadly there's no guarantee of that. Um, uh, and there've been many more strands of support and all were aimed at helping companies overcome hurdles, grow in confidence um, and knowledge um, to essentially help them carve out a financially sustainable and successful career as artists. Um, and then of course, um, the pandemic happened um, and the support that artists needed multiplied um, exponentially and altered entirely. So, yeah, I mean, the sheer catalytic energy that was required to sort of bring theatre back um, post pandemic left both artists and organisations just on the brink of burnout. <laughs> um, and we, we knew that we were stuck in these sort of short term programming and, and sort of development cycles. And the results of those were that sort of create well stifling creative risk primarily and then and just exhausting artists so artists were broken and audiences were bored was our sort of view um so through a series of artist focused initiatives including things like the knot festival which we hosted at our completely free to use ndt broadgate space over in the city of london which was last summer um we made it a priority to ask artists what the issues they were facing were in this sort of post-pandemic new normal landscape that we found ourselves in. Um, and then we set about thinking up some meaningful, uh, radical ways to sort of really help try to respond to those needs um, whilst making space for real bravery and, and a sort of new way of thinking which ultimately is what led to intervention one. So uh, on the first, I think it was the first of August last year, uh, we announced a radical, the most radical artist intervention, um, which was through a season of no shows. So we announced we would go dark for six months um, with no work presented on stage at all. Um, and instead offering up our biggest ever investment in developing a new slate of bold, risk-taking work towards working towards a new movement in British theatre. Um, so not a big ask. Um, we went dark across all social media platforms, which was glorious, uh, and invested all of our time, energy and focus into working with a selected group of uh, companies uh, through a sort of dedicated, no strings attached programme of R&Ds to fund artistic dream time, messy new ideas, uh, giving companies the time and space, and actually critically the belief um, to take on those ideas that always felt too scary, too unfundable, to allow them to sort of fully embrace, to fully embrace them without the worry of thinking, oh, but will they want to program it at the end of all this? Or what if we don't have anything to show at the end of this and there's just nothing? We, you know, we took we took all we took on all of those worries so that they didn't have to. Um, so I mean, we knew our artists needed this scale of of intervention. We'd listen to them, but this was a once in a generation moment, uh, and we needed the full support of our board to make that happen. Mm. Understandably, 
there was a lot of concern. <laughs> Excuse me. There was a lot of concern around the notion of going dark to begin with. And okay, we've got about 30 seconds. Okay, right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Of course. I told you this would happen, you other. Um <laughs> capture the story. There was a lot of concern um, that it would be too big a risk financially, no guarantee of success, uh, which of course was a distinct possibility. Um, but the key thing here was that our board listened. And in the same way that we listen to our artists, they listened to us. Um, and they allowed us to convey how critical this moment was and that without it, we basically risked losing a generation of artists. Um, and we'd never get work back on stage that was of the standard that we so fiercely championed. <coughs> Beyond the listening came the trust and, and, you know, yes, obviously a financial microscope that interrogated the budget to ensure it was just the right side of risky, uh, but they backed us from the get go. And, and that gave us the belief to, to know it was the right thing to do. Um, yeah. And, and then we could just focus on delivering, you know, the most game changing level of support in our history. Right, I'm done. I'll stop now. Damn, that was a that was a line and a half to drop on. Can't <laughs> wait to come back to find out a little bit more about um, how you got the, the board on side. Um, over now to Sarah Weir, who is, the, is, a, is a trustee for Claw Leadership. Um, over to you, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Suella. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Weir. My pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman with short cropped white hair. Uh, I'm wearing blue glasses, a white shirt with black stitching, a patterned jacket and 3D printed black earrings. So that's me. <laughs> My first provocation is where are the men? I think I'm right in saying, Jonathan tells me there are seven men here among 50, 74 people. The title of this uh, session was The Pressures of Mental Well-Being. If that title had been The Pressures of Financial Well-Being, would there be a different audience here? That's, that's a question and provocation, because this is this well-being, this is not a this is not a woman thing. This is a people thing. You know, we all have these pressures. And in fact, in terms of mental well-being, something came up this morning as we were sort of getting ready, which is that Stephen uh, is not very well. Stephen has COVID. Now, one of the issues, I think, at the moment is that you know, he's here. He probably shouldn't be here. He should be in bed. He does have an 18-month-old who's running around with COVID as well, so maybe that wouldn't be a, a nice, calm place for him. But, you know, it's sort of partly expected that he would be here. If we were for real, of course he wouldn't, because he would be at home. So I think the pressures of mental well-being are something we, we need to get past this. And I think there is a bit of a dichotomy between, you know, oh, the finance side and the mental well-being side. It's, it, being in silos like that is really, really unhelpful. If you're going to walk down a tightrope from one end to the other, the only way that you will do it is with your arms out and constantly moving like this, keeping things in balance. If you stop on the tightrope, you fall off immediately. But that balance is the mental and the financial well-being. That's what keeps things going, that balance, balance, balance all the time. And the two questions we were asked to consider are, how do boards square that need to balance the budgets alongside well-being of staff and what actions can they take? Um, on the first one, listening has been mentioned by several people. Listening really takes time. It really takes time. And I think one of the things about listening is that everybody hears something different. So what I'm saying to you now, 74 of you will hear something a bit different. And if I asked three or four of you to play back to me some of the things I'd said, <laughs> there'll be four or three or four different stories because that's how we are as human beings. And it's really important that trustees realize that, that when they are doing that listening, that things are going to be heard differently by different people. And that's influenced by all sorts of things about how safe people feel in the space, sometimes about how junior they are, how senior they are, what their position is, whether they're bored, whether they're stressed, whether they're, you know, all sorts of other things. But it absolutely has to be done because I think there needs to be a better understanding between trustees and exec. Yuella at the beginning was talking about, you know, the fantastic work that she's doing. And she was talking about that thing about rest for the staff. 
And it reminded me that back in the, because I'm older than all of you, I was alive and working in the 20th century. And I can remember bringing something in when I worked at the Royal Academy of Arts. I was director of fundraising there and I wanted, people were exhausted and I wanted to bring in something for them to have some rest, rest time. So I just built that into people's day. I didn't really care what they did. They could go off shopping, they could do whatever. Anyway, people got to hear about this in the rest of the RA and they were not happy, not happy. Someone said, but you know, they might just be wasting their time. And I said, well, what do you mean wasting their time? It's how you use your time. If they feel better after that, a bit like, you know, as um, Sophie was saying, you know, they'll be refreshed. I remember taking that to the Arts Council. And again, people feeling threatened by saying, let's have a compressed working, let's do this, let's do that. And other executive directors in the Arts Council, I was running Arts Council London, coming back to me and saying, well, oh, you, you, can't, you can't do that. We've got staff saying that they want to do these things because London's doing it, but I don't want them to be doing that. And I said, well, well, why not? I said that this is an issue. This is an issue of management rather than anything else. So I think that listening thing is hugely important. The next thing I would say is, and this is a provocation to all of us, is power dynamics. We had the first discussion at the Claw Board this week, which Hilary Carty, the executive director, had asked me to lead about equality, diversity and inclusion. And we talked about power dynamics. They're real, they're alive. We all have to understand our privilege properly, properly understand it and understand that some people don't feel able to speak because, sometimes because they are nervous or uncertain. and We've, we've got to unearth those and talk about them a lot more. Uh, fifthly, language means something. And it's different generationally, definitely different generationally. And I think we have to, again, be aware of that as trustees. If we are older, Uellas aren't, but some of the rest of us are older. And we need to understand that things mean something different and almost get that played back to us so that we don't misunderstand what we are hearing. And the last thing I would say is this is like a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, you know, in a marathon, you have to go steady and you have drink spots where you stop and you pick up a drink and something happens. This is the same. You have to have actual things that are happening at specific points so people can see the change. And I would just end by saying with all of this stuff, just start. Um. So there we have it. Thank you so much to our panelists for so generously offering their insights and their experiences around uh, well-being. Um, and I'm particularly interested in some of these challenges because it feels like there is a bit of a tension. And I think everyone's mentioned a bit of a tension, whether it is in terms of um, being able to prove uh, or, or convince a board or, or the governance um, to allow something to happen, to take new methods, to, to pivot slightly, um, you know, whether it's around um, the kind of the connection between the board and the staff team, whether it's around um, governance culture, or workplace culture itself. So I, I really wanted to kind of pick up because I think a lot of you, a lot of the panelists have um, experience of being trustees or, or of that governance. Um, to kind of look at the kind of governance culture, you know, what are some of the ways in which governance priorities can often be seen in opposition to team staff well-being? I don't know if anyone wants to pick up or, or share their insights on, on that. Yes, Sarah. Just one thing I would say on that, and you're, you're right, Yuella, is that I think there's a formality which is built into board and governance stuff, which people find, people who aren't in that room, if you like, find a bit overwhelming and they don't really understand it. And I think that we, we probably need to demystify some of that. And maybe some of that formality isn't needed. You know, you probably do it very differently. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you particularly, you know, as long as you're getting a, your due diligence done, yeah. and responsibilities as a, as a trustee, or a you know or a, um, a a board member you don't necessarily have to be formal because formal means unpersonable exactly. you know and actually what is needed is a real person-centered approach over to you Diana just, well I would agree completely with Sarah on the need for demystifying that sense of like what, what are the trustees discussing because I definitely see colleagues in organizations sort of wondering that. So would agree with that. 
I think the other thing in terms of difference in what you're talking about there is that I think often trustees focus either on the kind of longer term or there's a natural inclination perhaps to sometimes focus on the longer term external or kind of short term crises whereas actually as again Sarah was saying this whole piece around well-being is a marathon so it needs to be part of every agenda and um, discussion because yeah it, it's not something that you can just sort of tick off and not have on the agenda. It's, it's interesting. I'm just going to hand over to you, Stephen, but I was just going to point to something that you mentioned about the relationship between the board and the staff team. And maybe in more smaller organisations, that might be something that's quite easy. Um, but maybe, you know, for Diana's organisation, Somerset House is quite big. Um, you know, if there, anyone has any ideas, um, I'm also looking at you, Stephen, because you also had your hand up, about how you can kind of merge a little bit of that and kind of get get rid of some of those barriers between, you know, the governance and the kind of delivery teams. Yeah, I think um, the first thing I was just going to say was around governance can be a real barrier to actually creating diverse boards. I think it can put a lot of prospective trustees off. So what we end up is a, a churn of similar trustees applying for multiple organizations or the same kind of people applying for, for 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 similar roles and actually to get really truly representative boards what we need to look at is actually how do we make being a trustee attractive to somebody that maybe is not thinking it might be something for them and you know being being faced with having to read a 200 page board paper Mm -hmm. um, reams of finance spreadsheets that they're like whoa I don't understand where this is coming from it's really intimidating when people who are asking a lot of people to do these jobs when they've already got their jobs and so they're doing this in their spare spare time and actually I think helping new trustees with onboarding with mentoring with um, training and development to be able to get them into that space and actually recognising that we're bringing you for a particular set of skills not to forensically look at every single line by line even though that is important to be across everything as well at the same time so i think there's something there around governance can be a really scary thing that puts people off and i think on the visibility side of things i think whether you're in an organization of 10,000 people or 10 people actually i think as sarah said at the start you've, you've just got to make that start you've just got to actually be out there so if you see somebody in the corridor smile and say hello and ask how you are sort of you know I, I used to say to one of my chief execs when you see someone in the corridor just say hi how are you have you got everything you need to be able to do your job you know that 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 is was an immediate conversation starter that would then uh you know and often they would hear things they would be like no i don't have enough pillows in in a and e so then we would go away and sort that that out. And actually, you're hearing things that that then creates that ripple effect, you know, because the person that you've spoken to will go away and say, well, I've just had a really good conversation with with X. So if you've got all of your board asking those questions three or four times, the ripple effect of that will spread through the through the organization. So I think that's really um, yeah, I think just starting and again, not being a lot of it is intimidating, but just trying to just take that first first step towards um, opening opening up. And then other things that you can do, um, you know, uh, whether it's podcasts or voice notes to go out to everybody from your from your trustees or or video messages or um, you know quick updates or um, shadowing members of staff, you know, reverse reverse shadowing so that you might have your trustees sit with other people in the organization and, and, and get men, reverse mentored as well I think is, is something that's really helpful the more of that you can do you know this isn't this is not about boards doing things to organizations this is about organizations working together of which boards are part of so if you're setting things up boards need to be part of that process as well definitely I think it's really key that idea of reframing what where the board sits within this within the organization you know they should be part of it they should feel um included and everyone should feel like they have a stake and they have fair ownership i think what's been really interesting and particularly what you were talking about Stephen and sarah about power dynamics 
um, you know, whether it is um, diversity inclusion, whether it's access, you know, part of creating a space where people, um, you know, or centering well-being is about ensuring that people feel like they can bring their whole selves or at least the whole, all the selves of them, all of themselves that they want to bring into work. Um, what are some of the, and I, I'm kind of opening this out, you know, what are some of the the ways in which your organisations or the work that you've done um, specifically tries to kind of um, address some of those barriers and some of those power dynamics that are inherent in society? I think in part it's recognising that well, recognizing them. I mean, that's the that's the start, isn't it? But also recognizing that we're all individuals, so different people will feel comfortable feeding back or sharing their ideas in different ways. So making sure that there are kind of a range of options. So I suppose what we've done before, during, and coming out of COVID is um, making sure we've got uh, uh, we've continued with more kind of staff meetings than we ever had um, prior to COVID, that the sort of social interactions and ensuring that those social interactions aren't always happening at the end of the day or in ways that kind of exclude some. And we've certainly increased the number of um, sort of staff networks, whether that's our mental health first aid champions, we've got very active anti-racism task force. But one of the challenges being that uh, when people feel sort of stretched how do you encourage um that um sense that actually it's, it's okay to take time out to focus on those kind of really important group discussions um so I think those are some of the ways that we're looking at things at um at Somerset House um I think you know for us as a venue at New Dharma I mean access has always been like at the absolute core of, of everything that we've done since we opened. I mean, I think we were the first sort of regularly unfunded theatre to have captioned performances and then that grew into relaxed performances and access very much sits at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and all of our programmes and our offers and our schemes and everything, we, we try to, you know, really ensure that they're, you know, that accessibility just sits very much just within everything that it stands for. It's not a sort of additional strand and, and art, critically, it's never an afterthought. It, it's just absolutely within the values of, of what we deliver. I think for us, that the key thing that we always come back to is, is just listening. We just try to always ask, listen to all of the feedback from, from everyone that engages with us from trustee level right the way through to obviously all of our artists, but our audiences, it's just about, it's about listening to what those needs are and then just responding to them but in a really meaningful way um and and, and a reactive way and and often just quite quickly i think that's what you know i think that's what we pride ourselves on doing quite well is that i think a lot of these topics are confronting um and, and sometimes difficult and challenging but people just like you know every, there's the goodwill to obviously sit and have the you know have forums and talk and discuss what can be done but often we just need to i forget forgive me, I forget who, who said it, but we just need to start. Um, and I think there's a lot of hesitation, there's a lot of worry, and there's, I think that worry is a worry about getting it right. And I understand that because obviously we're all being inter interrogated, we're all under the microscope. And if you get things wrong, you know, people will tell you. Um, and there's a fear around that. But the, the damage of that is that then often people do just stall too long, you know, at actually getting going with stuff. And post COVID, you know, that need is, is greater than it's ever been. And, you know, we need to find, we need to listen constantly, find ways to respond and actually create those environments that allow people to thrive personally and professionally and get away from that mindset that factoring in an hour for, for people a day to, to just have some space that, you know, to, to allow them to, you know, be their best selves. That, that shouldn't be, we shouldn't be scared of that as, as organizations, as leaders, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be afraid of that because that's absolutely critical to, to people being able to just not even thrive, just survive. Like I think we really, really, we all know that coming out of um, the pandemic, we're, you know, everyone is so, is so bruised, you know, we're in this completely new, new landscape that we're still all navigating and, and we have a duty of, of care to look after ourselves. Um, and I think a lot of that just starts with people just trying stuff and just giving it a go because that's all we really can do. 
Thank you. Because um, I think, you know, from our perspective at Rising, we are a CIC, you know, we're a social enterprise. And we, I guess, we're privileged in some ways that we have, you know, a few non-exec directors and we have an advisory board. Um, so we can, and we're quite small, so we can move and we can be quite agile. I'm just curious to, I don't know if anyone here is a charity, um, you know, like how that relationship is slightly different because as you as you said, Sophie, about being under the microscope, I think there was a lot more pressure for trustees to feel like they're doing their due diligence and ensuring that they are, you know, fulfilling their charitable status. You know, um, I don't know if you can speak to that, um, Diana, about, you know, what 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 that experience is from your perspective of trying to um, make change or maybe um, or pivot with, with uh, trustees that, you know, have got a, a particular legal uh, remit. Hmm. I, I actually, but maybe this is, other people have got different experiences, but I wouldn't see a, a significant difference between being a CIC and a registered charity and definitely the governance about being a charity has to be followed, but ultimately it's about public benefit and are you fulfilling your charitable objects? And certainly all of our trustees would completely agree you can only do that if you've got a motivated resilient staff team to be able to do that and I think we at Somerset House and probably everybody have, have are recognizing the importance of uh, staff as that key enabler in a way that was not taken for granted in a negative but maybe not as kind of out there um, before I think on a slightly different tack but one of the things thinking about the differences is it's quite interesting to look at what the corporate sector are doing and some of what um, they're deploying because I think those of us working in arts organizations we're, we're sort of so mission-led and we're all passionate about what we're doing but sometimes that means I think that uh, we think well that's 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 enough whereas actually you know it's not enough is it you've got to look at all ways that your staff feel um empowered and resilient and have the kind of tools to do their job not just because they kind of love the, the outcomes of um of what we're all doing Definitely. Well, could i just add something in there just thinking about um big organizations so uh i think that covid actually speeded up change for bigger organizations in a way because they just had to. So when COVID started, I was uh, running the Design Council in, in a chief exec job, and I was a trustee of the Alzheimer's Society, which is a massive national charity. So the Alzheimer's first, there was a frustration among trustees, among all of us, that making anything happen was like, you know, pulling teeth. I mean, it was just, what is the problem? Why is everything so slow, so slow, so slow, so slow? And then COVID happened and suddenly we had to just immediately go into a different mode. And actually what we did is we had a tiny group of trustees of which I was one. We met with the chief exec online. This is every, every week or sometimes every day to help her. And it just opened stuff up that is sometimes for years we couldn't seem to get cultural change to happen. In the design council um, job, we, we ha had to, we pivoted very, very quickly. By luck, not good judgment, uh, I'd actually sent, we, we'd become a, um, an online sort of organisation about nearly two years earlier. We were completely working on laptops and everything else. So that, that, that was just, I think, um, <laughs> luck on my part that we had that. But it was certainly, again, the trustees, a little group came together to help me and we met sort of once a week. So it speeded things up, I think. And it was about not letting it go backwards after that. Can I make one other quick point about the thing that Becky said? So Becky, yeah. I love the um, edge dweller. Becky says she's a new trustee here. You can see it in the chat. She's an edge dweller. We need edge dwellers. So if you imagine a page of a book without the edge, the words would all fall off the page. So we need the edge always. Thank you for being the edge. And the practical thing I was going to say about trustee meetings, thinking of edge dwelling, is in the meeting we had for CLAW last week, uh, which I was leading, I was a bit nervous of doing the conversation. I knew the chief exec was a bit nervous about doing the conversation. We had differing views among the trustees. I wasn't certain how it was going to go. And so what I did is I reached out to three other trustees uh, who are all very differently diverse to me. 
and we had a pre-conversation and we all talked about our slight nervousness and we were able to get our own fears and anxieties and worries out, which meant that when we came to the meeting, we were all then quite relaxed and right. all three of us spoke and you could do that in any of your boards. It just really helped. And both the other two said to me, it made it so much better because we weren't worried. We'd said the things we were worried about. Uh, and it just made everyone else, I think, a bit more relaxed. So please carry on edge dwelling. Amazing. Thank you for edge to all the edge dwellers. Um, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna head, we're gonna have a five minute break now. Um, I think you know the conversation has been so uh, yeah so great and it's been really great to kind of hear the different differing perspectives while you're on the break I, it would be great if you could just reflect on your relationship to governance you know the ways in which you are enabling and maybe actually not helping um well-being within your teams um your boards and also yourself um so hopefully you can look out of a window while you do that so we'll give it five minutes and we'll back be back at um 11 well okay 11 minutes um we'll be back at 11 32 fast thank you so much um well thank you all for joining us back again we're gonna be heading now into um your questions you know hopefully that that panel discussion was an, um gave you a chance to kind of think about the things that are coming up for you at the moment i just wanted to share while you're thinking about your questions and feel free to either pop your hand up using the um using the, the function on zoom or pop it into the chat with the words question beforehand so we can see um, but something that was coming up for me was kind of building off of this um, this point that that Sarah was making about um, women's work, you know, and, um, you know, I think there's often this um, this unspoken responsibility for people um, of difference to be doing a lot of that accessibility, diversity, inclusion, well-being, caring work. Um, and caring work is is often underpaid and undervalued in our society. So kind of thinking about the ways that we can be good allies um, and actually instigate some of that work ourselves and not always waiting for those who, you know, who, who have a particular access requirement to advocate for it in order for things to change, but actually being proactive. You know, um, some of the examples um, that I really love thinking about is even just things like policies, you know, how you can enable people to bring their whole selves, whether it's kind of thinking about gender affirming policies or new parents policies, you know, breastfeeding rooms. Often there is a requirement, you know, if if pe new parents want to breastfeed, there isn't usually enough space or a separate private space for them to do that. I've heard stories of people having to breastfeed children in cars, their, par their partners bringing the child to work, breastfeed in the car, go back to work. That What does that do in terms of your, your, your work-life balance? What does that do in terms of thinking about your relationship to your work um, and your well-being? I think there's a responsibility there to kind of eradicate barriers. And it was quite interesting, Sophie, hearing about some of the work that you guys are doing. A lot of it is around actually investment. You know, actually, you recognize that for your community, financial um, hardship and barriers is, is, is preventing a lot of people from either making the work that they want to make or living the lives that, to just survive. So actually thinking about what are the barriers when you're doing this listening work? What are the very real barriers for people and what what ways or what are the resources that you have or your network have um, that can help alleviate some of those? Um, so yes, on to, on to the questions. Um, we've got a great one. Okay, so let's start with Becky. Um, Becky, did you want to read this yourself or are you happy? Becky Owen. Uh, yeah, can do. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, no worries. I think it was Diana who was talking about ways of capturing staff experience beyond a, an annual review and beyond the anecdotal i was just really interested in hearing a bit more about how you collected that data and what that looked like and a bit speaking back to what you've just said actually uella that would be great thank you oh thanks becky um so yes we do a kind of annual staff engagement staff sentiment survey but what we've recognized is that that's brilliant that's always a good thing to do 
but that it would be good to take pulse checks. So have more regular kind of asking a couple of questions. So it's, so you're getting a, a sense of how staff are feeling. It's like a temperature check, I suppose, more regularly in the year. And um, in fact, the trustee that we've just taken on who specifically has this kind of people well-being mandate has suggested that. I think the other thing that I realize we probably haven't done as well as we could have done is actually making sure we're always asking consistent questions so you can compare a bit more. I think we're really good at setting off on new initiatives and then you look back and go, okay, but what, what can we really um, draw on from this? So um, those are a couple of thoughts there. Great, does anyone have any extra on the panel? Do you have any extra things that you wanna to add to that? or? Are you happy for me to go on to the next question? I was just going to add, I think that that's, um, I think that's a really good point about consistency of that listening and asking of those questions, because, um, you know, one of the things that I think historically with New Diorama, um, that we that we did not brilliantly was that we had so much will and desire to improve things for our artists and for our audiences that we'd often run before we could walk and whilst I think that you know there was merit to that because it all came from a good place of wanting to do better um, which is very much what we're about and um, I think the the downside to that was often in doing things kind of albeit a bit hastily um, and then we wouldn't often check in so there were certain strands of support that we would do um, and let's say for 10 strands of support, eight were delivered brilliantly and we'd get really fantastic feedback, but there'd be two that slightly, we just, you know, we were under-resourced, we, we didn't have the scope to, to always follow through and like, you know, find out and listen and to sort of people's feedback on how that had been delivered. And I think, yeah, or, although people appreciated that we were trying, you know, obviously for those people that engaged with that, those strands of support, they didn't have a great experience because they were like, well, you know, the will was there and we appreciated that you wanted to offer that support to us, but but then, you know, it wasn't brilliantly delivered and you didn't check in with us afterwards to find out like how you could better improve it. So I think that kind of consistency around, you know, picking up those conversations, you know, beyond like at timely moments, just to make sure that you're really, really listening and, and engaged with what that support looks like. Um, so that people can feed back to you and, and, and you, you know, you've got a, a really clear trajectory on what you need to what you need to improve on and how you need to deliver that is really important. No, that's a really great point, Sophie. And actually, it touches on this idea of actually part of that well-being and um, psychological safety is around knowing the processes when things don't go well or things don't don't work when things go wrong. You know, what what are the processes for that? How are they held? Um, and often um you know when it comes to things like disciplinaries and stuff like that you know those become this is when this idea of formality comes in real hard and yes you can be formal but you can also be a uh, person-centered and ensure that it's a really accessible process and it's clear um and making sure that people um you know still feel like they can advocate for themselves in those spaces so I think that's another another space that you've you've touched on in terms of yes being consistent in terms of asking those questions knowing where you can improve but also if things do fall apart if things don't go well at all what are what are the kind of mechanisms for holding that amazing all right let's go over to um just want to shout out is it is it Sierra or Kira probably Kira are you it's Kira, yeah. Kira, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for shouting out the book, the no is it the No Club, putting a stop to women's dead end work. Yeah, Ooh. it's really it's really good. I was reading it last night, and it really, I mean, it's yeah, it really spoke to Sarah's point. I think about work that that doesn't get paid for um, uh, is crucial for organisation success, um, but. Uh, doesn't get rewarded in any kind of other what they call non-promotable tasks so things that women take on mm. the social life the kind of committee work etc cetera, etc cetera, but that is very valuable for the organizations but is not ultimately going to lead to promotion for those women but so some of it spoke to to the points that Sarah was raising I think really really helpful I've only just started reading it but it's great no, that's fantastic. And I, I read a, a similar thing in um, We Need to Talk About Money by Otega Owagba, and she spoke about 
exactly that thing but this idea that actually organizations are built on it and without that work that inherent work that women do whether it's cleaning up the mugs at the end of the day or just straightening up or remembering these people's birthdays and stuff the organizations would fall so I think that you know if we think of women as being leaders in these in this space what can we learn from them and how can we take that burden off of them um as well as all the other people who are also contributing um, to, to kind of creating these kind of um, good workplace cultures. But thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from Fiona. Fiona, did you want to read out your question? Um, yes, I can slightly elaborate um, in that I'm a trustee of an organisation, National Children's Orchestra, that's based in Bristol and I'm in London and another organisation that doesn't have an office. They all work from home. And so it's quite difficult to bump into them in the corridor, which I'd love to do and ask the team how they're feeling. But well, you only really see them at board meetings and at events and performances. And it's not really appropriate at that point to say, how are you really feeling? I mean, of course you can ask them. So how can we as trustees of charities really look after the well-being of, of the team we can ask the management but we may not be seeing the rest of the team and that that was something I was really interested in today I love some lot of the I'm buzzing with lots of information so thanks so much I've got a oh I've got a thought we've all got thoughts on that that's uh, I think we did some really good things in during the pandemic when we were all forced to work remotely and in the the speed of getting back up and running since there are probably a few good practices that we have put on hold but I mean one of the things that I'm I think would be good uh, would be the kind of hybrid sort of coffee mornings the kind of having a kind of coffee date with a cluster of staff um, together uh, for half an hour because those have been in the past invaluable and you know I know exactly what you mean about before COVID lots of things happened informally meeting up before shows we at Somerset House have got so many new staff and new trustees that how you re-embed those relationships is a bit more challenging but if you're all remote I would have thought that the the remote coffee can still work. Sarah, you had an idea. Um, well, that's that's the thing about going first, Diana. That was going to be my point, the coffees. <laughs> so, uh, but beyond the coffees, which I think you can do, Fiona, quite easily. We did it at Design Council and we did it with a trustee and about maybe three or four other people. You don't want one-on-one -on -one because that's completely terrifying for the person. <laughs> and actually the trustees were really nervous. They would often say to me, what, 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 what should I talk about? I'm like, oh my goodness, well, you're an adult. So, you know, just sort of open your mouth and start a sentence is a, always a good place to start. But two or three people, maybe have somebody in the group who's quite chatty and then, but make space. And this is important. I used to say this to the trustees, for the quieter ones, because, you know, some people will be happy to be there, but they don't want to be put on the spot. They don't want to suddenly go. So what do you think about blah, blah, blah? So, so don't do not do that. But maybe find everyone could bring to, to that meeting um, something that they'd noticed in the last week, you know, or ask a question, because then everyone can answer the question in a different way. The other thing we did was um, instead of brown bag lunches, uh, we would be at home with our soup and sometimes we would share a recipe. So we'd all make, I don't know, lentil soup, whatever it was. And then we'd um, show our bowls of lentil soup to each other and then we'd all eat it. So we were sort of sharing an activity, um, even though we weren't together. And I think because um, actually the thing about being all being at home is activities often when you're together, can tend to be, and particularly in the arts, can tend to be around alcohol. And we made really an, quite an effort not to have activities around alcohol for all sorts of reasons. People don't want to necessarily be around alcohol. And I think that's very important because that can be quite excluding for people. Uh, when you're sitting in your home, of course, that's much, much easier. But, but I think just do it in a casual way and don't make them too long. Just say it's 20 minutes, then it's not so frightening. Brilliant. Um, yeah, we've got we've got questions, two questions that I want to want to go over to before we before we close. We've got one by Bev and one by uh, Robert that are quite similar, but maybe you could both um, ask ask you, ask a question and then we can hand over to the panel. Um, so Bev, are you happy to 
say your question. Yeah, thank you. So my question is, how can we ensure that we as boards, um, so how can we ensure that we as boards keep the wellbeing agenda front and centre so that it leads to systemic change? The reason why I asked that question was in 2005, six, I was a CLAW 2 fellow and my research and my core focus was about women leaders and well-being. And what I've uh, and now I'm a coach and uh, facilitator change, working with change with leaders across the cultural sector and people come to me as organizations and individual leaders around well-being all the time to such a degree that I wouldn't actually have a living if it wasn't for the fact that there was so much um, dysfunction in in our in in the system. So my concern is around the choices that we make mm. as trustees and board members. And, and, the, and an underpinning question is what does enough actually look like because the boards lead the culture of an organization as do the leaders and if we make different choices that has a ripple effect in the organizations so i'm just kind of curious about this where we're talking about my what i think of as micro well-being issues but um, what i'm looking what i'm concerned about is the system and how we lead our organizations within that system Beautiful. Um, Robert, do you want to um, share a little bit about your question? Yeah, I think my question is really about not just what we do, but how we do it. Mm. So it's really, you know, that around speaking to the, the, maybe the biggest transformation comes when we actually allow people to do things for themselves, when we encourage them and enable them. So it's speaking to how organisations can actually enable people to do fix things for themselves. Now that actually might be the biggest transformation. And I wonder what the panel's thoughts are on that. Amazing. So we've got two very meaty, beautiful questions. Um, yes, Stephen. Yeah, I've, um, there's a few things that have just come to mind to both of those questions, and I'll, I'll try and be as concise and as quick as I, as I can. Um, one of the um, thoughts I've had is around... Um, how boards can actually, you know, be brave in their thinking about not just doing things because we've always done them that way. So organisations that I know of that have scrapped appraisals instead for wellbeing check-ins, it's quite a simple thing to do. So rather than holding people to task about what they've done against a certain amount of metrics, asking them how they're feeling, asking them how they're supported by their line manager. Um, I think staff want to see that, boards have got their backs and that can come in a different number of ways so even answering the question that's just come before this one around what boards can do from a distance is it's kind of be visible in your circles be advocates for the organizations that you're you're working for and the people that you you represent but also i think there's a real fear of and justifiably so in many cases a real fear of failure so you know that this sense that actually i can if i make a mistake i'll get pulled up for it in my appraisal and I'll get pulled into a meeting with my line manager and we'll go over it. like you know so that there's a there's a fear that actually they don't want to kind of be bold in what we're suggesting or what we're trying to do because that will come back on us but actually if we sort of fail well where we're honest about why these things might have happened we encourage failure in some respects we we kind of talk about why that might have happened and what we can learn from the next time um I think is something that will then encourage these kind of ideas to snowball and, and and generate and generate pace the other thing is around actually really being brave in what we're actually committing to doing so at organizations that i've worked at in the the arts where uh they are disability led and they're expecting disabled performers to appear in venues that have got poor access presenting and performing to predominantly able-bodied audiences because the venue isn't accessible and actually calling that out and actually in some, some cases those organizations have said you know the fear of refusing to appear in those organizations until they've made change is the cost of that is the financial risk rather than the cost to the to the person you're asking to perform or the people that you're not including in that audience you know so I think it's it's a bit it's a bit of a sort of 
tangent, I think, in some respects, maybe. But but that actually systemic change comes from calling those things out. Like, actually, how do we, um, you know, and that that therefore is having the back of your your staff who then see what you're doing and then and then braver to make different um, suggestions and different ideas. And that then that it just grows and grows. Hopefully that answers the a, a, a bit of brain fog, but hopefully that answers the, the question. That's fantastic. Over to Sophie and then Sarah. Just a really quick add on just to, to, to what Stephen just said, just from from a board perspective, I think what just to, when those things when when um essentially that it's really useful sorry trying to articulate the thought in in my own mind um really useful for boards to keep that momentum up so from my from my experience and and, and my perspective from new diorama you know our, our board are you know, wonderful and incredibly well intentioned and they and they were so supportive in that and we'd have these board meetings which you know you really felt like oh brilliant it's absolutely at the top of the agenda this is great you know we're going to roll out this really really yeah, amazing meaningful uh you know sort of program suite of, of support and it's going to be incredible and then you know for us as a senior as a senior leadership team uh, you know on the ground running a theater you know we understandably then get completely bogged down with the operations of everything and it's not at all for, for lack of it being a priority for us because it absolutely is but understandably you know we're pulled from pillar to post we're running a really busy organization so i think what's really important and what what you know and i, I don't think I speak I don't think I'll get you know held to account for this it's good to be transparent about these things I think our board in, in the past you know have slightly lost focus with that so beyond those board meetings then there'd be a real distinct drop off of momentum um, a lack of kind of checking in and then we'd realized that you know by the time the next board meeting came around we hadn't actually really made any meaningful change and implemented any of those things that we talked about and you go through the minutes and you go oh gosh you know that's 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 not good enough you know so I think having that sort of really authentic um yeah the, the sort of momentum from the board to keep checking in with the senior team and make sure that those things remain a priority and that things are really being done to actually roll out you know whatever that program whatever those changes are um I think that's really really helpful for from from the sort of executive perspective if that makes sense Sarah uh, yeah, a couple of things. So firstly, Bev, for you, um, when is enough enough? Uh, never. I think it's always, you always want to keep the glass quite full. It'd be a bit like, when is the show good enough? When is, you know, the artist good enough, et cetera, et cetera. It's never good enough. You just always keep your standards high. So I think that's the point on good enough. It, just always keep it high. But you're absolutely right about, um, you know, looking at the big picture. And I remember when I was a board member of Bristol Old Vic some years ago, and the meetings tended to start with a whole lot of stuff about finance. And I was thinking, my goodness me, you know, we're sitting here in a theatre. And I remember saying to, um, to, to the directors, I said, start with the art. Now, in this instance, I think we could go start with the heart because the heart is at the heart of everything we're doing is the well-being and without that there is there is nothing now you know you'll get some people rolling your rolling their eyes at that going always oh, back into the women's thing start with the heart but i i don't think it is i think it's you know being your heart and your head they absolutely have to go together so that's the point i'd make on, on yours on yours robert i think you're absolutely right the answers are invariably within the organization and I can just think of one example of something that I did many years ago actually when I was running Arts Council London and it was in a bit of a sort of not a great place when I took it over and there were these staff meetings that were meant to happen once a month and we had one right at the beginning and it was absolutely awful you know I had to stand up and sort of spout at people and they all sat there looking bored to death and I thought, oh, no, no, this, this isn't good. I'm, I never want to have another staff meeting. So I said there would be no more staff meetings. But what I did is I opened a space on a day for people to take that space and do what they wanted, to start to bring artists in or this or that or the other. I was there for I can't remember, about three and a half years. 
And by the end of the three and a half years, you know, I was lucky to get two minutes in that meeting. It was completely taken over by the teams who would then, you know, showcase their work or do this or do that or the other. And apparently they carried on doing that for years after I'd gone. Um, and it was all about how, sometimes it was about how they changed things within the organization. It's nothing to do with me whatsoever. And then we actually showed the trustees some of that change as well. And it made a real difference. And often, you know, you could see the quiet stars come out and you could watch them blossom and you go, wow, I just didn't know that person had that in them. And it was quite an easy thing to do, but it, it's because people felt safe. They weren't going to be judged. Nothing was going to happen. Um, it was just about, OK, now it's your space. Take it. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that we could kind of um, come to an end with those beautiful big questions about systemic change, because for me, um, this work, this is what it's all about, you know, when you're thinking about the arts, when you're thinking about the, the civic duty of our organisations or the work that we do, it is to create change, it's to influence culture, it's to bring people in, it's to um, call things out, it's to be a reflection of our society and, and kind of present it back to, back to society. So, um, you know, I'm really loving these ideas of calling things out, you know, pay feels like a really important thing as a trustee um you know thinking about actually where the what, what does your the way your money is allocated in your organization shows what you value so just kind of using that as a as a way of as um one of a basic way of kind of um of, of assessing that you know looking at what where is the invisible labor happening you know where is the invisible labor happening whether it is women in the organization cleaning up the mugs whether it is disabled people like actively doing a lot of free consultancy on your accessibility policies like where is all that invisible labor happening how can you resource that better how can you unburden people um thinking about your mission of your organization whether it's a charity whether it's a cultural organization you know using your mission as a way to give you permission to do some of these things you know bu bureaucracy often gets in the way and then just kind of making sure that you've got people at the heart. Thank you so much to our, our panelists, Sophie, Stephen, Sarah, Diana. Thank you very much. Thank you to Jonathan and for Freya for holding it down in the chat, passing over to Jonathan now. Cheers. Thanks, Uella. Um, as ever, and you've got a, such a brilliant group of panelists and actually such a brilliant um, set of people coming to the webinar asking some great questions. You always end up feeling a bit shortchanged, but you are thanks particularly for sharing this so beautifully and to Stephen, Diana, Sophie um, and Sarah as well. Thank you. The one thing I'm taking away from this is when is enough enough? And the answer is never. I love that as a <laughs> as a aphorism for this. Um, I do hope you've all found the discussion helpful and I hope it's provoking you to maybe try some new things, ensure some of the people you're working with in the sector are supported. Um, and the, the other thing I'm really coming away with very strongly is what Stephen said at very near the beginning, actually, about listening and responding as a ripple effect. So you ask questions and don't be intimidated by what you hear back. That's for me is, is such a powerful message. So thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we will be posting the recording from today um, on a YouTube channel with the private link. We'll email that out later. I'd really like you to encourage to rewatch you to rewatch this session, but also to share it with your fellow trustees. Um, and anybody else you're working with, you feel would benefit. Um, we're just putting a link in the chat to a survey. Thank you, Freya, that's just gone in the chat. It's four questions. It will take you about 22 seconds to fill in. Just do it. It will come um, up at the end as well of the, of the session. Um, thank you. That's really helpful to us. Um, and um, uh, just finally, um, if you have any other questions cropping up as a result of today's webinar, please do feel free to email them across to Claw Leadership. Um, and to the Cultural Governance Alliance, there's an email address, which I think is also going to be in the chat in a second, cga at clawleadership.org. I'm very happy to take any further questions. Um, but that leaves us just to say a big thank you to everybody for coming today. It's been really insightful, really appreciate all the contributions um, and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.